North Korean fighters who have come to Russia to fight in Ukraine have been called mercenaries, cannon fodder and second-class citizens. But former North Korean soldiers and other military experts say many are willing to die because it is their chance to escape the grim conditions at home. As the Wall Street Journal writes, due to the specifics of their upbringing, they can demonstrate extremely high motivation in battle, even when fighting far from home and for an unfamiliar cause. According to former North Korean soldiers, almost all the fighters sent to Russia have a similar motivation. They are taught from an early age that they must sacrifice everything for the supreme leader without a moment's hesitation. The deployment of troops will be seen as the opportunity of a lifetime to bring money and glory to the Kim Jong-un regime. Those who die become heroes, those who survive return as heroes, the publication notes. As the Wall Street Journal writes, even the best North Korean troops lack modern equipment and resources. As David Maxwell, a retired U.S. Army Special Forces Colonel, says, many North Korean soldiers, even Special Forces, spend most of their time on farming or construction work. North Korean Special Forces training produces highly disciplined soldiers with high loyalty, often willing to take extreme risks with limited equipment. In the North Korean Army, however, the Special Forces occupy a special place. They are better fed than other units and undergo more intensive training in infiltration, destruction of infrastructure and assassination. State television showed footage of soldiers training, smashing light bulbs with their bare hands or bending metal rods. The DPRK claimed that each Special Forces soldier was equivalent to 100 enemy soldiers. At the same time as former DPRK Special Forces soldier Lee Hyun Seung says, during training it was mandatory to attend daily ideological training classes where slogans about the readiness to die for the Supreme Leader were repeated. They may be sacrificed without achieving much in the war, but they will not dare to question the leader's order to go to Russia, Lee says. According to Bang jong Kwan, a former major general in the South Korean army, due to the language barrier and unfamiliarity with the terrain, the potential role of DPRK soldiers in Russia is limited to infantry. They will suffer heavy losses because it is unlikely that Russia will provide them with modern equipment or intelligence, Bang said. At the same time, former North Korean military officials say many soldiers will find the risk worth it because a foreign assignment raises their status in the country, giving them access to prestigious positions. It has recently become known that Pyongyang has sent several thousand of its troops to the Russian Federation. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky reported that there are already 11,000 North Korean troops in the Kursk region and they have already suffered losses. At the same time, according to military expert Alexander Kovalenko, Russia does not fully understand how to effectively use the DPRK military at the front. He noted that the key problem is the interaction between this contingent and the Russian forces. Do you really want even further global instability costing precious life? United Nations Climate Chief Simon Steele asked delegates in a passionate speech on Monday in Baku, delivering opening remarks at the COP29 summit. Soaring rhetoric, urgent pleas and pledges of cooperation contrasted with a backdrop of seismic political changes, global wars and economic hardships as United Nations annual climate talks began Monday and got right to the hard part, money. We must agree a new global climate finance goal, Steele said in his opening statement. He said failure to reach climate goals would result in higher energy and grocery bills, weakened economies and global instability, for everyone. If at least two-thirds of the world's nations cannot afford to cut emissions quickly then every nation pays a brutal price. If nations can't build resilience into supply chains, the entire global economy will be brought to its knees. No country is immune, he said. The financial package being hashed out at this year's talks is important because every nation has until early next year to submit new, and presumably stronger, targets for curbing emissions of heat-trapping gases from the burning of coal, oil and natural gas. That's part of the 2015 Paris Agreement for nations to ratchet up efforts every five years. 
The long-term global average temperature is now 1.3 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial times, only two-tenths of a degree from the agreed-upon threshold. For the world to prevent more than 1.5 degrees of warming, global carbon emissions must be slashed by 42% by 2030, a new United Nations report said. We cannot leave Baku without a substantial outcome, Steele said. Now is the time to show that global cooperation is not down for the count. It is rising to the moment. Excellencies, delegates, colleagues, friends, it is an honor to welcome you to COP29. I thank Dr. Sultan Al Jaber and the Emirati Presidency for their tireless work as they pass the baton to President Babiev and Azerbaijan. This UNFCCC process is the only place we have to address the rampant climate crisis and to credibly hold each other to account to act on it. And we know this process is working because without it, humanity would be headed towards five degrees of global warming. We cannot afford to continue upending lives and livelihoods in every nation. So let's make this real. Do you want your grocery and energy bills to go up even more? Do you want your country to become economically uncompetitive? Do you really want even further global instability, costing precious life? This crisis is affecting every single individual in the world one way or another. We must agree a new global climate finance goal. If at least two-thirds of the world's nations cannot afford to cut emissions quickly, then every nation pays a brutal price. If nations can't build resilience into supply chains, the entire global economy will be brought to its knees. No country is immune. And even as temperatures rise, the implementation of our agreements must claw them back. Clean energy and infrastructure investment will reach $2 trillion in 2024, almost twice that of fossil fuels. The shift to clean energy and climate resilience will not be stopped. Our job is to accelerate this and make sure its huge benefits are shared by all countries and all people. In the past few years, we've taken some historic steps forward. We cannot leave Baku without a substantial outcome. Appreciating the importance of this moment Parties must act accordingly. Now is the time to show that global cooperation is not down for the count. It is rising to the moment. So I urge you all, let us rise together. I thank you.